Well, first of all, let me make a very important uh, correction. I am honored to be the only non-professor who is speaking here today. Um, first of all, thank you very much, you know, for having me. Um, uh, I feel I have mixed feelings, actually, about um, being here today, because I was thinking, as I sat here, I was actually thinking about my father. Um, my father got to the United States before the war. Um, he left Poland as a 17-year-old boy, went to Germany to learn a trade. He, uh, the trade was to be a watchmaker. Uh, and his company sent him to the United States to get parts. Uh, and he got to Ellis Island, and the Irish immigration officers said, are you here as a visitor or is it permanent? In a flash of, of an eye, my father said permanent, and he became an American. Um, he continued his trade as a watchmaker. Um, and then sometime during the war, he started to have a series of mini strokes that took away some of his flexibility. Uh, and when you have to deal with very, very small parts of a watch, you have to really have all the dexterity so you could deal with the parts. And so after the war, before I was born, he gave up his business, traded in, it was a very small, small shop. It was a one-man shop in Journal Square in Jersey City. And he took the few pennies that he had and he invested it in the stock market. And he traded penny stocks. Um, he was not particularly good at it. And there were times, even I remember it in my youth, that my father, he would go to Journal Square and he would go to Dreyfus and Company and he'd sit there in a room where a lot of people would sit. In those days, you didn't have uh, CNBC. And he would watch the ticker and wait for his little penny stock to come up. And he'd be sitting there praying that it would go up just enough for him to sell a few shares so he'd have money to buy a Shabbat meal. That's a true story. So I often think how proud he would be that his son would grow up to run a stock exchange, the Philadelphia Stock Exchange, and be vice chairman of NASDAQ. On the other hand, as I was sitting there, I was thinking that I'm the only person in the room that has to wear a earphone so that I can hear the translation from Hebrew because his other dream was, as all his children would grow up to be from. <laughs> so not only am I not a professor, but I got thrown out of four or five different yeshivas along the way. So here I am, dependent on that wonderful woman over there who's keeping me in the game. I got a call one day from a man named Arthur Levitt. He was chairman of the SEC. Um, uh, he knew that I was working um, in real estate. I had worked for the government most of my life. Uh, then I was offered a job by the Reichman brothers to become head of um, U.S. development, public-private partnerships, actually. I, I had been president, of Battery, president and CEO of Battery Park City. Um, and. Um, uh, Arthur knew that I had left ONY and um, I was driving up to my country house and um, a voice on the phone, on the cell phone says, Sandy, how would you like to run the Philadelphia Stock Exchange? I said, I knew it was Arthur because he never says hello or goodbye on a conversation, he just starts talking. In fact, I found out later that he called my house first. I got my son, Aaron. Um, who was in his early teens at the time, uh, and he started off exactly the same way, and my 13 or 14 year old son took the job. <laughs> um, so that too is a true story. So I said, listen Arthur, I know nothing about stock exchanges, I know nothing about capital markets. Um, I don't know a put from a call. Uh, this is insane. He said, no, 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 no. He said, you have the skill sets. It's all about skill sets. Um, he said, Philadelphia is a floor-based exchange. He said, they're all Ghanaf's. I can't have a national exchange close on my watch. I need somebody who'll go in six months, take it, merge it, and I won't have to deal with the problem. On my first day, I met a terrific uh, young woman, Diana Tannenbaum. So as I walked in here, guess who was here? The first person I saw when I walked into the Philadelphia Stock Exchange. So. Nice to see you again. I hope that you continue to be a good omen for me. 
Um, and um, I was faced with the stock exchange, which was on the brink of extinction. In fact, it really was, you know, in a technical sense, it was bankrupt. We just couldn't admit it. And we had to restructure the exchange. And so what we did was, we looked at how we were about to do this, and the first thing that we looked at and understood that we had to do was we had to rebuild our technology and we had to change our structure. Why? Because saying nothing bad against the people who were essentially running the exchange, um, they all were parties of interest. And so what we realized had to be done was that we had to demutualize the exchange to allow us to open ourselves up not only to new investment but to new ideas and new governance and new approaches to how business was done. And so we went on a journey, we rebuilt the technology, uh, we did have to increase fees, and we did have to open ourselves up to demutualization. The difference is, in the United States, you didn't have to get an act of Congress to allow for demutualization. In the United States, the regulator had that power inherent in the 34 Act. And one of the major differences that I see between Israel and the United States going to the issue of overregulation is that on one hand, people think you have a regulator that is overregulates, but in fact, you have a regulator who in a lot of ways has less power than most other regulators and therefore is constrained by doing a whole lot of things because he or she, whoever the regulator is, has to go to the Knesset, the parliament, our Congress to get those sorts of changes. You do not have to do that in the States. It is right there in the structure of an act that is still today called the 34 Act. So we have a lot more flexibility to the system because the regulator has more flexibility to do it. I'm not going to re or recite all the things that have been said before. I essentially agree with everybody. Israel is overregulated. Israel desperately needs to demutualize. You're going to get nowhere with the existing structure. I disagree that um, you necessarily have a direct line in the short term between lower fees and greater success just because you demutualized. What you need to have in demutualization to be successful is a plan. The demutualization is not the last act, it's the first act. It's what the Chinese proverb describes as a journey of a thousand miles. It is the first step. And it is an absolutely necessary step. But together with that first step, you have to have a plan. And I take my hat off to Amnon Naibach, who has come into the exchange in a more operating role, a more executive role than a chairman role, and has moved very, very aggressively to develop a business plan because you can have the demutualization, but if you can't tell an investor where you're going or what you're going to do, who's going to invest? They would have to be a moron to put any money into a situation where you did not have or see the roadmap to the future. If you did not see the direction in which the exchange, the entity is going. And so the planning process, the roadmap is absolutely, absolutely critical. The point that was made by the last speaker is absolutely correct. Stock exchanges, or at least the ones that I know of, and even the ones that I see from a distance, are all internationalizing. The Chinese are developing direct links between Hong Kong and uh, Singa uh, Shanghai, and between Hong Kong and Shenzhen, and other stock exchanges. The need to sort of globalize who you are is absolutely imperative, because you cannot be an island. Now, Israelis are way ahead of the institutional structures in, the United, in, in, in Israel. They are globalizing. Israel is a startup nation. And 80% of the intellectual property that is developed in Israel that, com that com becomes part of startups or companies disappear from Israel through M&A. There are a lot of companies, you know, close to 100, low 90s, who list on NASDAQ. I was asked by a reporter who asked a very, very interesting, and I think on, on point question the other day, when she said to me, um, 
aren't you a fox in the chicken coop? Aren't you your competitor to TAS? And I said, how are we competitor to TAS? And they said, well, you take all the good listings. I said, we don't take anything. The companies that list on NASDAQ are companies, they, they are Israeli companies that are seeking high, more liquidity, you know, higher value assessments. They're looking for global markets. Israel cannot be an island. Israel has to be very much part of the world. Its companies are too small. A lot of its companies are too small for its boundaries. They cannot exist. Teva could not be Teva if its market was Israel. Checkpoint could not be Checkpoint if its only market was Israel. You have to be global. This is a small country with extraordinary talent and extraordinary opportunity. And we have to globalize the stock exchange. I was asked at another forum, why doesn't NASDAQ require that NASDAQ companies list on TAS, or at least the Israeli companies that list on NASDAQ? We don't tell our companies um, where to list. In fact, we beg them to list on NASDAQ. So it's hard for us to turn around and say, oh, and by the way, you should also list. You know, that doesn't make any sense. But what makes sense is for Israel to recognize both the need for the globalization and the need for building its domestic market. And so if you go out and ask Israeli companies that list on NASDAQ whether or not they want to keep their relationship and stay in Israel and even trade on Israel like Teva and the companies that you pointed to, they say yes. But then why does less than 50% or about 50% of the companies, and by the way, that's a number that's going down, and they will say it's because of regulation. So whether or not there is a true issue of overregulation, there certainly is a perception of overregulation. So it's either one or the other, and it doesn't matter. It comes out to the same thing. It is a barrier. Now, Israel and TAS are not the only, are not the only um, exchanges in the world that suffer from bad branding. Every stock exchange suffers from bad branding. I'm on the board of the WFE, the World Federation of Exchanges, and there isn't a meeting that I go to I'm, uh, that I am not the person in the room who is pounding the table and saying, you know, let's stop all of this discussion about how we can increase our ability for advocacy to advocate the stock exchange position or whatever that is, which generally is less regulation. But I said, we should be talking about branding. Because if you took a poll, even of the most intelligent people in the United States, Hillary Clinton supporters, um, and ask them what a stock exchange is, they can't answer. What is a modern day stock exchange? You hit it, Professor. Uh, um, a stock exchange, and, and so did you in your speech, Shmulek to a certain extent, and, Everybody talked to these issues. The fact of the matter is, a stock exchange is not what a stock exchange used to be. The American stock exchanges, NASDAQ, the two big American stock exchanges of any, um, of any size and any identity at, in the 90s, early 2000s, were the New York Stock Exchange and NASDAQ. Both of them were on the brink of extinction, like TAS. Certainly, you know, when you look at the numbers, they're on the brink of extinction because essentially they were one-trick ponies and they were boutiques. They sold essentially one product in one market. That is a boutique. And then if you look at the example of two stock exchanges, you know, and um, I don't want to boast, but I'm with the winner, you had, and, and there's a reason for that. When I decided that we could not stand alone in Philadelphia, we took, we went out to the marketplace after we were demutualized and after we were able to bring in investors because we had a good business plan to show them. Um, and we went through a process. We essentially had a tie between New York and NASDAQ. And then I went out and I looked at their business plan. And I looked at NASDAQ's plan, which was a diversified business plan. It was a globalization plan. And New York's plan essentially was to replicate itself by buying another monopoly, Euronext. Today, the New York Stock Exchange exists essentially only in name, and it's 1% of the balance sheet of the ICE. 
So when I'm out competing for a listings, I always refer to them as the Atlanta Stock Exchange uh, because that's where most of it is housed. Um, the difference is, is that well before I got there, Bob Greifeld, when he got there, totally, the, totally looked at NASDAQ and went and recreated the enterprise as a multidimensional, uh, completely diversified entity. Recognizing that A, you had to be global, and B, you cannot be dependent on one line of business. And so today, NASDAQ is a global company. The employees in NASDAQ who originally were very, very upset when Greifeld came in and said, um, the days of wine and roses are over. Um, there are no more raises, except for the lowest level of people there. But you will be paid well if you do two things. One, you perform very well in your job. And number two, that the company does well. It's called profit sharing. And everybody above the lowest level at NASDAQ has to sing for their dinner. They have to perform. It's a performance-based environment. And guess what? Because of demutualization, a lot of those long-standing NASDAQ employees are very rich. I miss that, but, you know. The fact of the matter is, when Greifel got there, NASDAQ was trading at three. Today, it's in the mid-70s. Not bad. So, demutualization became a vehicle not just for NASDAQ, but for all other stock exchanges to diversify, to bring in new blood, to get the, the fox out of the chicken coop, which was the boardroom, to bring in a more diversified level of interest in it. It forced the exchange to have a plan, to have a business plan, and to justify its business plan in the marketplace. Every quarter we go and have to justify what we're doing to analysts. And if we have a lousy plan and our projections are wrong, we pay for it in the marketplace. So the message I have is clear. Uh, I think uh, the regulator has been the primary advocate for something very, very important. Um, here, revolutionary, um, and revolutionary everywhere it's been. Israel has some very real challenges because the population, as I started to say before, has been ahead of the structure. Israelis are global. They're trading in stock markets, but not necessarily TAS. They're trading in New York, they're trading in London, they're trading in Hong Kong, they're trading all over the world. And you have to bring them back. You have to rebrand re yourself. The regulator has to be extraordinarily open-minded, mindful, of their primary responsibility to regulate and protect the interest of the individual investor in this country, but has to open itself to new ideas like trade everything. It has to open itself to a variety of different kinds of approaches, all of which will require regulatory approval and regulatory change. The regulator has to feel secure that in doing those things, he at all times is protecting the integrity of the market and the security of the investments made by individual investors. But these processes have to move forward. They have to move forward quickly, and they have to move forward successfully. Or you won't have a stock market. I truly, truly believe that. Now, I think there are some very good things that are happening here, and I hope they continue and I hope they continue quickly. Thank you.